Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. My name is Chris Oliver. Today, I'm lucky to be joined by Alex Sarama. Alex is involved in basketball operations for the NBA covering Europe and the Middle East. He's involved in a number of initiatives over in Europe and the Middle East in growing the game of basketball, growing coaching, and helping with player support. Alex, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Great to be on the show today. Alex, just to start for some people, they may not have uh, much of an idea what someone like you would be doing uh, in terms of helping supporting basketball and the growth of basketball overseas. Can you explain a little bit your role? Absolutely. So we have a small basketball operations team uh, here in Europe. I'm actually based in our Madrid office, and we're responsible for growing the game of basketball, um, whether it's grassroots or elite, and we have a number of programs. Junior NBA uh, is one of the programs we have. We've partnered with 18 federations throughout the region uh, to deliver that. We also have uh, NBA player camps. Obviously, we have a, a large number of NBA players from Europe. Um, so over the summer months, we support them with, with the camps they run. And then also we have elite programs. We, we had the first ever NBA uh, global camp in Treviso a couple of weeks ago for, uh, for the top NBA uh, draft eligible prospects this year. And, and other random events such as NBA global games, uh, etc. So really just any on-court element uh, is something we're involved with. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, having traveled to Europe and maybe a lot of the coaches that uh, are listening to the podcast from North America haven't had that opportunity, I, I can I can say without a doubt the quality of coaching, the quality of players, the quality of, of player development, and I, I believe uh, the, the quality of the development mindset of the coaches is outstanding. And something that we can all learn from is how they develop and grow the game. So really excited to have you on there. And I know you'll add some ideas to this as well in terms of that. Coach, let's start with, why are we talking? How did we get Absol connected? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I was in uh, Trieste in Italy uh, watching some of the, the youth club practices. Uh, really, you know, really, really good. Came away with a ton of notes. And, you know, my question uh, when, when I reached out to you is just how you saw 1VO fitting into the whole games approach. Um, and, and that was something I was looking at in Trieste. Obviously, they, they did a ton of games based or small sided games in their practices, but they always started with some, some one VO. So I wanted to pick your brain and then just discuss how, how you saw that fitting in. Well, it's a great question. And when you sent me the email, I said, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm so happy we connected because I know we'll be able to share back and forth as we go through over the next little while our development, but uh, also just, you know, the complexity of answering that question as a basketball coach. And I want to make it clear to everyone that I'm a basketball coach. I'm not a skill acquisition coach. You know, I'm not, uh, no, I'm not a learning, learning theorist. I'm a basketball coach. So my goal is always focused on making it as practical as possible for my players, but also applying a lot of the evidence-based research that I've learned through the years. And, and as we know, that's the challenge. And so much of coaching is guided by historical and cultural norms that a question like this one is is great for us to be able to get into a discussion with. And, I, you know, w coaches can decide for themselves whether, you know, I'm right or you're right or, you know, anyone's right or not probably, but um, it's fascinating. So, so give us a little bit of a background first before I ask the question. How old were the players? And was this an elite-focused camp or was this their specific player uh, development program within the club? Absolutely. So this is the club youth program. Um, so the, the players are 15, 16, uh, playing at a very high level in Italy, one of probably you know, the, top, the top youth programs, top youth programs there. Great. So that gives us a little bit of context in terms of this. And I don't know how much that would have influenced my answer anyways. I, I think my answer is pretty much the same, that basketball is a complex game. We can all agree to that. Each time you get the ball, you have to make a decision. So really for me, without the skill, the technical ability, the decision becomes more difficult. However, in a team game, what we know is that no skill is executed two times in exactly the same way. The game is far messier than how we construct drills. It's far messier than how we construct practice. So technique is always tactically and context specific. And that's what comes back for me is what, what's the game's approach? What comes back to simulating the game by playing the game? And I think so many of these drills remove us from that context. So, so essentially what I'm saying is practicing the skills in isolation does not lead to transfer 
because essentially a learner has to relearn each time the skill with a different context. So if I teach you something in a one on one setting, you'll, you'll get good at that one on one setting. I mean, especially we're talking about a pretty, pretty skilled level. Like some of these players have probably done these drills, I would assume multiple times. Like this was a daily thing. Yeah, like sort of like a daily start to the practice, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes of, of going through it. And we'll, and we'll come back to that because that's an important context too, is that, you know, I, I've heard coaches call it the daily dozen, you know, yeah. the, fun, the fundamental tree, whatever it is, the terminology is it, but it's something that they do daily in terms of that. So, you know, uh, here's another thing that's going in that drills tend to encourage a coach driven expectation. Of, of what's supposed to happen. So what are they supposed to do in the drill is driven by the coach. Whereas in a games approach, I don't know, or a coach doesn't exactly know what the outcomes are going to be. So in a drill situation where it's a one on O, the coach says, okay, we're going to do underhand layups. Uh, you're going to go do, and do an underhand layup. And all the player has to do is essentially imitate what the coach asks them to do. So there isn't much room for self-discovery and there certainly isn't any decision-making because, you know, you've been told what to do and all you have to do to be successful is to imitate it. Does, does that make sense? Completely. And I think when you, when you take one on note, it doesn't take much to make it a lot more game specific for the players. For instance, the coach could, could just play some dummy defense and then already they're stimulating a different read. In Spain, coaches use a lot of signals uh, to develop players, like putting their hand up to determine the driving direction or a different type of finish. And just by adding a little bit, you know, extra to whatever one I know they're doing, it automatically automatically makes it a lot more, you know, game specific for those players. Which is great, and we're going to talk about that more because I know you you raised that too. And and there's there's obviously that's the progression. And uh, I talk a lot about progression, maybe too much for coaches who listen to this podcast over the next 10 or 12 weeks, but it's, I just think we use a lot of wasted time on useless progressions. And I don't mean useless. I mean, initially building a skill from scratch. Okay. There's some one on O advantage. There's some, you know, skill breakdown advantage. There's some isolated, isolated. We mean no defense advantage, but after that, there's very little advantage for a player and especially a player, as we would say, in that 15 to 16 year old age group that have already done the drill before. Basically, here's it for coaches. There's no form of practice that is more specific than playing basketball. So it's like, have you ever played tag? Well, you've gone to the playground. I, again, maybe you guys call it a different term, but you go to a playground and you play tag. You know, you don't break down tag. Like nobody's telling you or coaching you how to play tag. You, it's player driven. It's tag participants driven and that is another challenge of this process of doing so much uh, and, and again I'm not not saying they do so much one-on-one -on -one, but just doing one-on-o -on in that situation um, okay does that make sense I mean no absolutely absolutely so absolutely. And, let's go ahead yeah like taking the tag as, as an example it's that's a great great example I know Brian McCormick's done a lot of it and has some great like tag games to start practices with I just think as coaches, you definitely have to embrace the messiness in, in something like tag. And it's, as you say, all drills aren't going to be organized, neat and tidy. And as the coach, you have to give up some of your control that you'd have in a drill. And that messiness is where all the learning happens for the kids and the random movements. Um, and that's what stimulates you know, the game. And, and, and I'm not even advocating the coaches to do tag, although go check out Brian's tag games are great. I'm just saying that the problem, the problem ultimately is if you don't have a defender, you don't have a decision. Now, if that coach is the defender, it's guided or it's live defender, or it's some type of situation, uh, you know, again, th let's go back. Coaches constantly say, or they, they post on social media, we're doing a game like drill. Oh, this is a game like drill because they're coming off of a cut or a screen that happens in their offense. Well, yes, that's a game like movement in your offense, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's game like because there's no defender. There's no defender. So there's no sensory feedback. Uh, there's no visual cues. And 
you know, that process is really the most important part. And I say to coaches all the time, what happens first? Well, in learning, what happens first? Well, in, you know, playing basketball, we talk about all these decisions that happen, whether you're on offense or defense, well, what happens first? The first thing that happens is your perception. The second thing that happens is your decision. The third thing that happens is actually the execution, which is what we would consider the skill. And then the fourth thing is feedback. So if you look at that, you know, we spend so much time on the third part, we don't spend enough time on the first and the second part, which is the perception and the decision. And that's really what, what I come back to. And, and, and I don't want people to think games approach doesn't necessarily mean it's just small-sided games. It really just means, for me, is that we're always practicing with the defender. And, uh, and again, we'll talk to about that a little bit more. But, uh, you know, do, do you find that, that when you go watch a lot of these practices that so much of it is focused on the skills as opposed to the decisions? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, I think it, it really obviously depends on, on the club, but um, they always progress the practice. So let's start with like one on and then it goes to the one, one-on-one part, one-on-one straight after that. So obviously they're, they're putting the skill into context. But if you start with like perceptual action first, I, I definitely think that's, that's more beneficial because then the players are sort of learning, learning themselves um, and obviously, instead of practicing on air, they're getting the game relevancy straight away. Well, and that's, and that's so important for coaches to understand is like, what I'm saying is that not, again, one on oh, fine. Like it's not, I'm not going, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not me saying, hey, skip one on oh. Like, but I do find that most of these one on oh drills, a lot of the, uh, you know, blocked shooting where you see someone shooting it, you know, 10 times and making nine to 10 from the three point line. These are all more about developing perceived confidence. Like a player believes they can do something. And it's also about coach's comfort that the coach is comfortable because it looks like the player is executing what they're coaching them to do. Right? Like the coach probably feels good. And I'm not saying in this situation, but in general, if I do something on air, I go, Oh man, we really looks like we can do this. Well, Right. Yeah. And that makes me feel good as a coach. And then the third part is obviously tradition. And it, it really is a leap. And that's the hardest thing. It's a leap to skip that step for a coach because you remove some of those things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Some, I have some newcomers in my program this year. So when I do certain things with them, uh, you know, basketball decision training, yeah, we have signals, but we progress that even as fast as possible into one on one. Uh, you know, two on one, different type of advantage, disadvantage, small side games that uh, I'm sure you saw as well. And I have to constantly come back to that player and remind him, listen, normally you would be making 70 to 80% of your shots and feel real good about yourself. Now in these drills in BDT, you're making 40 to 60% maybe for a good shooter, sometimes a little lower and you're missing more. So that messes with their mind. That messes with their confidence. But you have to explain to them that ultimately, yeah, you're missing more. But you're missing constantly in a game context. So it's going to lead to better transfer to the game. And ultimately, the only thing that I can evaluate my practices or my player development on is the game. You know, coaches sometimes go from practice to practice and go, oh, we're really getting better at this drill. We're doing it better this practice compared to last practice well really the only evaluation of what you teach is the game like are they doing it in the game are they applying what you're doing in practice in the game so that's what I have to constantly remind my newcomers to is that this method makes them feel uncomfortable but if they stick with it which they will obviously in our program that they're going to see the benefits because they're practicing exactly the way the game is played Definitely. And I think a lot of coaches talk about situations where their kids, you know, look great in the practice, perform well, but then obviously that doesn't transfer to the game. And I think that's because in those practice sessions, what they've learned to do is, is a different skill to obviously what they're doing in the game. And you could take a classic drill, like the three now weave, that's probably another topic or a zigzag drill. And, and those are obviously very traditional drills, which coaches have always done. And then all players, when they become coaches, they grew up doing that. And then obviously when it comes to coaching, uh, there's just no transfer from a drill like, like that to what you actually see in a game scenario. No, it's, it, 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 it's so true, and, it, and it's so hard for coaches to give up 
a little bit of the, some of those traditions. And, 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 and again, coaches think, you know, certain drills, you know, develop certain skills and that's fine. Coaches should choose what, what they believe works. Cause ultimately there's a benefit to that as well, that a coach really believes in something. But uh, a general rule for all of this is, is if you're still doing the same drill a month later that you did a month ago, then you're not progressing. Your players aren't developing anymore. They're not improving uh, because one, they, they, they know how to cheat the drill because they know it. They're not thinking anymore because it becomes mindless. The more you do something, it becomes mindless. And we know that the game is not mindless. The game is constantly, players are constantly in a decision-making situation. And, uh, you know, because of that concept of keep coming back to no skill is executed two times in exactly the same way in a game. It's like, you know, we, we know that in those situations, you know, the, the technique is basically being executed in a way that wouldn't happen in a game. Because you wouldn't shoot it from the same spot two times in a row. You wouldn't do exactly the same layup in the same way from the same angle. So, uh, you know, those are the challenges for a coach because I know we're going against a little bit of comfort for some. But I, I do think this movement is afoot. And I, do, and I do think in general in Europe when I was there, their practices were far more progressive than most places in the world. Have you seen that in comparison to? Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's a lot of advantage, disadvantage type activities throughout the practices. I think practices, there's a very good flow to the practice in terms of the build-up. It's always, you know, starting small-sided, then adding extra players. Um, you can see how much that helps with the learning process. So, yeah, completely agree with that. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I, I, and I also get this comfort is that without the technical skill, Without the technical ability, the decision is harder. So I totally understand the mindset. The mindset is if if I teach them how to how to do a layup better, then they'll be able to do the decision better. But we just I just flip that and say, okay, we're gonna. I, I personally I don't care if you can do any type of layup that I teach you. I'm going to give you some possibilities, and then I'm going to constantly ask you if if you know, you're not executing it or you're not doing it, what's a better solution? Like, what's a better solution? Because ultimately, again, if we're talking about 15, 16 year old players, you know, they play basketball, they have solutions on their own. And I don't know if doing that much one on O really helps them, you know, any more than it just, they're, they're, they're meeting a coach prescribed activity and, and feeling good about themselves in a sense, which again, there's benefit to that. But ultimately, you know, if we put them immediately into a one-on-one -on -one, or if we put them immediately into, as you said, some type of signals or guided type of decisions, then I believe that's way more beneficial than doing a whole massive one-on-o -on as they progress. Again, maybe early in learning, they do the one-on-o, -on but after that, they, they should, you know, as much as possible, add the defender. Uh, well, let's talk about adding the defender, coach, adding the signals. Uh, I don't know if you know some of the specific things. Was it, say they're doing a lap drill. Was, was there a coach there? How were they cueing them? Uh, what type of, you know, was it random, the cue, or was it random, the defensive execution? Absolutely. I think the best example, actually, of this wasn't interested. I was actually speaking to Ricky Rubio's uh, youth coach, great coach for Louis Gill, um, and he, he actually developed just the, uh, you know, the, it was a three-on-0 three on drill, and he was standing on the basket, and he he developed 11 different signals with his hand actions based on different reads. Um, so it would be players, players starting up at, at the half, uh, ball hand in the middle, two wings, player would attack, put one ball down in the chair, and then drive. And then based on you know what hand he puts up, that could be a pass in one direction, uh, you know, a fist could be a pull up, just, you know, and he had 11 different reads. Um, and he, he was saying that obviously he, he layered them on, loaded them on as, as the players developed. Uh, and he said that helped so much with developing Ricky's, you know, IQ, decision-making abilities. Um, so that, that's one example of, of how, you know, signals are obviously used. Yeah, that's great because that gives a situational context, at least to a player, that there's going to be a decision. And, and again, it, it forces them each time uh, to, to, to include a little bit of randomness or variability in terms of the action. So, again, if I go in and I just do repetitive layups over and over, okay, we're going to do, you know, five underhand layups and then we're going to go five reverse layups and then we're going to do this or this, you know, a lot of times coaches don't even vary the location of the layup. Right. And, and each time, I mean, 
this is a constant within our practices. Is I am always telling my players, say we break them out down into a one-on-one situation, you know, and stereotypically they start on the, say the 45 or they start on the elbows or wherever it is. Well, I will constantly be saying to players, do you only play from one spot? Like, and, and this isn't something I, you know, I prescribe, like I say, Hey, listen, we have to constantly, I'm just saying like, let's think like go to a different spot each time. It's a great also, example. And layup lines, obviously always yeah. done from that spot, but, and players automatically, when you say they go to that 45 degree angle, yeah. and, you know, that's not where you have layups on in the game. Nor do I want it. Okay. We're going to do the 45. Then we're going to do the baseline. Then we're going to do the top. And I want it to be player led. And that's what I really try and encourage because we're always trying to find situations for our players to communicate, for our players to lead, for our players to follow. So we try and as much as possible, make those player led situations and saying, listen, on your own, make sure you're constantly switching partners because you don't play against the same size player. So if I only play against you, Alex, I get used to playing against your size, your athletic ability. But you know what? I play against different players all the time. So I want to play against big, smalls, talls, mediums, whatever it is, and constantly change that. Uh, and we know even more so at the youth level that they tend to play partner with buddies. And, uh, you know, besties don't go after each other as well competitively. The, all these different Very things. Sure. But really, we just want our team to interact like a team and constantly change and vary it. So, so there's an important part of that, you know, beyond just talking about the signals that Coach Rubio's coach had, which, which is great. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Decision cues like that are a bridge. They aren't the answer either. Like the only true decision making is offense versus defense live. And uh, when, when we talk about this, the other thing that you see a lot is a coach there, guys going in for a layup or girls going in for a layup and a coach will you know, hit them with, with a, you know, I yeah. don't know, a bag a or pad. Of love, yeah. a pad, like there's something there. And it's like, okay, that's, that's again. And I kind of just go, sometimes we do want to remove that work to rest ratio. We want to keep it. So it's not as competitive because if you drop competitiveness, you drop the, you know, the, the energy expenditure of a drill or of a practice. And sometimes you're just going, you know, lighter in practice, I guess. But for me, again, why is there just not a player there? Why are we not just playing one-on-one -on -one at the rim? And we'll do something. So like, people always talk about one-on-one -on -one is, hey, you know, Alex passes me the ball and we're arm length away and now I got to beat you off the dribble or I got to beat you with jabs or something like that. But one-on-one -on -one is also I make a dribble move at the top. And again, I wouldn't make this predictable. I'd say, okay, go make a dribble move at the three-point line. I don't care which one. Make a dribble move at the three-point line. Attack the basket in one direction. Defender at the rim simulates the help defender, sprint one step the opposite direction, recover, and now it's one-on-one -on -one at the rim. And now that's that exact situation that we're talking about, but in a live and random way that I don't know what that defender is going to do. So now as the decision maker, I not only have to execute a skill, but before I execute the skill, I have to perceive what I'm going to do, decide what I'm going to do, and then execute it. And to me, that's, I, I, there's no... There's no age appropriate step for that. That's, that's immediately. Cause again, like we're saying that's not age appropriate or someone's not skilled enough to do that. You know what the problem is? As soon as they play the game, they have to do that. So then why are we playing the game if it's not age appropriate in practice? And uh, I constantly come back to that question as well. So is that, uh, it, did you see some of that type of, uh, you know, situation a little bit more when they went to live defender Did the live defender, they could do whatever they wanted. Completely, like especially with the with the two on two stuff they had. You know, the help defender, you know, would be would be arriving, and then you know, based on the timing of the help, whether it's early or late help, then obviously that determines the finish or or the read. So yeah, a lot of that in the two on two, three on three, etc. Well, and, and again, it's it's important for coaches to provide decision making not just at the point of the ball, but also at the point, as you said, point of the pass, point of the uh, execution at the rim, whether it's versus help or, you know, versus your defender, but also off the ball. And, and again, that's the advantage really for me is that, uh, you know, if we're talking about the modern game, we're talking about draw and kick, we're talking about penetration reaction. And we always have that context if we're always playing at least in a two on two, three on three, four on four situation that there's, it's not just the decision on the ball. It's a decision off the ball, decision to pass the ball, decision to read the defender, and then the players off the ball to make decisions. So there's just, it's such a complex game. I just, I guess at this point in my life, I just find it really hard to break it down and, and feel that I am 
developing my players in a way that's going to help them be better in the game. And I guess that's where I come back to too, as well as that so much of training and I don't necessarily want to talk coaching, but player workouts is one on one. So true. So true. And obviously now with the, with the season, we're seeing all these workouts on social media and, you know, you see players looking down at a cone and it just, it's, you know, no, no transfer to, to that and what you'll, you'll do in a game. You know, and again, like for, for perceived confidence, you know, for sharing on social media, look at me, I'm doing great. You know, all those things are, 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 you know, that's, that's part of the modern game. We, I guess we have to embrace it, but for, for in terms of, as you just said, like, practical value there's none there's no there's no one-on-one progression that i believe has a practical value after initial learning so uh even uh, we're maybe too focused on layups but it's kind of i i I picture exactly what you're saying because i see it a lot of practices this dirty dozen or fundamental dozen like we're going in we're going to do an underhand layup an overhead layup and but you know what i see and i believe this starts at the youth level is that we have this very predictable, I don't know if it's coached or it's just becomes because of a nature of a youth player that they just need the strength to be able to shoot the layup. But so many layups are shot at the top of the head, right? That, that as yeah. I find at my level, I'm doing with 18, 19 year old, your guys. And I find one of the things I have to immediately tell them it is create a constraint saying, okay, for this whole practice, you can't shoot from the top of your head with a layup. You have to learn to manipulate the ball outside your body, in front of your body, you know, different places. And, and, and so here's the problem. Okay, well, I'm working on that because on five of the layups, they have to go underhand in front. Well, the problem is, again, they're doing that in a really predictable, organized way. So when they actually go play a one-on-one, there, there's no constraint to force them to use that. It's just what do they come back to? They come back to the overhead layup because that's what they've developed comfort with. So using a constraint in that way, listen, for this one-on-one drill, you know, you can only score using these things. These are the things that shape learning more than just a one-on-one drill. Absolutely. And I think, I think there's a common misconception with, you know, more traditional coaches I've spoken to who don't think that with a games approach, you can, you know, develop those skills. You have to use the drill to isolate it, to teach it. But using those conditions is such a good way to, so, you know, work on specific skills, take dribbling, for an example, if you say you only have to dribble with your weak hand in some sort of tag game or whatever, that's instantly improving, you know, that skill in a way more effective manner than you'd get in an isolated context on it. Well, it's, it's a great point because, you know, the other part is that too many clean drills, you know, just, just again, they, they create too, too big a gap between what the simplified drill is teaching and what the complex performance, uh, you know, skill or, or decision is demanded within the game. You know, the clean drill just, just is too simplified. And, you know, again, do we want players within the game to say, okay, am I running the right line? Am I doing the right thing? You know, or do we want them to just, again, play free, to play free? And playing free doesn't mean, hey, just do whatever you want. It just means, you know, the constraint of the coach is removed in terms of the coach's expectation about what they should do in this exact situation. And again, that's what drills do. That's what drills, so many drills do where there's not, there, there's no options within that drill for players to find solutions on their own. And, uh, you know, the other part of it is, you know, the advantage. And again, I saw this in Europe so much and just, the advantage of small sided games is that you create the situational context. They compete within that context, but often within that situation, what you thought you were working on changes, right? You find that players are like, okay, well, I thought I'm setting this up to work on, you know, a uh, ball screen, uh, you know, defense three and three, we're going to play, you know, here's, we're going to work on different types of ball screen defense. In them. But then I'm finding out, okay, well, what I'm really working on is, you know, my player's ability to peek off the ball screen, my player's ability to be able to find space, whether it's a roll or a pop, uh, you know, types of re- recovery positions from the weak side. Like, there's all these things that come up, which, again, yeah, you know, it's really hard to coach one thing at a time. So mixing them, interleaving them, weaving them, whatever, whatever it is, mixing them, that, that, that leads to that more permanence in terms of their, 
their 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 future application, as you said. Does it does it actually happen in the game? You know, and I would come back to every drill you do, every single practice after you play your next game. Look at the practices you ran that week and say, did those things happen in the game? And if not, you're taking valuable time away from a player's development. For sure. And I mean, for the benefit of the coaches listening to this, in terms of drills serving a purpose, what's, what's your thought on drills having a time and place? Like, is there a context, say you're using a game and you, you see you use the game first to introduce something and let players discover it for themselves. Then if you see you know, them struggling with a particular element of that, would you use a drill to isolate it, but then make sure the drill's game-like and specific in some way, or what would your thoughts be on that? So it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in isolated shooting practice still. Now, when I say isolated shooting, I don't mean blocked standing at a spot. I mean basketball decision training where we have, you know, four to eight cues that can stimulate a decision and mix them in a random way. But I also mean in terms of, you know, some dribbles three times between their legs and then shoots a ball where they're working on, you know, dribbling, popping, footwork, picking up the ball, uh, shooting, like those things mixed together. So I, the complexity of what I would call isolated practice might be different than, as you alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. someone just dribbling in space, going between their legs, doing a prescribed type of dribbling thing. So that, that, that's the first part of kind of coaches maybe understanding what I mean by isolated uh, practice in, yep. in my world. So yes, there's a place for that. And then yes, absolutely what you said. If I find something's not going well, then you can go back. I, I just like starting there and building it up. One, it's a danger for your best players because, you know, if we're talking about learning, we're talking about optimal challenge, you know, and you can't have optimal challenge within a group of, you know, 15 players. So you have to decide who's going to get optimal challenge. I say this all the time. My optimal challenge is going to be focused on my best players. So my, my, my players that aren't as developed are going to struggle more. And maybe it's not optimal challenge for them, but I do feel they're still getting task representation about what they have to do and what they have to work on. And then we can go back. And as you just said, we can, we can isolate a little bit more for them. But if I isolate all the way, or if I do one on O for all of my players, then it's not the same benefit for all my players. Like again, to think that an NBA player needs to do dribbling in space by themselves. I just find it hard to believe that there's a benefit to that. You know, and people say warm up and all this other stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. It's warm up. It's comfort. The player has a routine. They like that. That's great. But after that, man, they need a defender that's live. Like, like that's it. I mean, they're at that level where they need a defender that's live. And to, to isolate it so much, just, again, it can't be interesting. <laughs> I mean, for an NBA player to get that many reps or, you know, even a high level player that we're talking about that's been in a club organization for a while. There can't be many ways. So yes, go back and find the problem, find the solution, create a drill. Like mostly I would do coach. What I would do is I would find a drill that works on that specific context. So it's like I say, okay, we're having a hard time finishing at the rim. Okay. So we're going to do something that gives the advantage to the offensive player to beat their check so that help has to rotate. And now they have to make a decision at that point but there's going to be, say, say, it's three on three or, you know, three on three. So there's two players off the ball that also are going to be giving them some type of cue saying, okay, I, yeah, I have a solution. At, maybe I have a solution at the rim, but maybe it's not the best solution. Maybe the best solution is passing it, you know, so they have those type of perceptual decisions. And then you yeah. add constraints to it. Okay. On this situation, you know, defender on the ball you have to get beat. So we'll start you behind, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a handoff in front. So now the defender's behind. Now they have to try and recover. So now you're at the point of the help at the rim. You got to make the decision there. Okay. But we're also going to say sometimes, all right, listen, there has to be one kick before it's live. So now off that dribble, when you beat your check, you're drawing the help at the rim. You, 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 you have a constraint that you can't score at the rim. Now you have to kick out respace and then play off that live scramble situation. So there's different contexts that you can give to things and you can do that with any one-on-one. -on -one. 
Uh, and, and listen, coach, I do want to ask you about one-on-one because you, I mean, that's really the natural progression that we're talking about from one on to one-on-one, but how many of those one-on-one drills were really game like too? Because I find that's the other problem is game like exactly. one-on-one. So maybe talk about some of the, and, and not specifically about, uh, you know, the actual club we're talking about because we're not, we're talking about every club, but, uh, what were some, what are some one-on-one drills that you've seen that, uh, yeah, that's a great point. So I think, you know, some of the, some of the one-on-one stuff, how kind of closeouts that they were doing was, was good, very game-specific. But then, you know, as you mentioned, just checking the ball and playing one-on-one from, one, one one from the spot on the wing, that's that's not getting like one-on-one. So, you know, just very simple things you can do to create the advantage-disadvantage, like the defender on the hip, uh, behind the back level, um, you know, stimulating help, having to, to arrive at a certain time. I think those are way better examples of, of progressive one-on-one than just starting old school checking the ball and playing. <laughs> You're so true. I mean, checking the ball, again, it just doesn't happen in the game. So even starting, like like I get frustrated sometimes, and I'm not saying we don't do it because sometimes we do it just to start, say, trips of the floor. But, you know, to have an initial starting point in the middle of the you know, of the, you know, jump circle or whatever, where your players check the ball and they start a five on five progression. That doesn't happen in the game either. So we try and start as many of our trips as possible from, you know, from a live shot, live closeout, yeah. live shot, or from a, you know, an inbound situation, because again, generally that's how you start your trip. So, so, so the context that you start your one-on-one is so important. And, uh, you know, and you said closeout because so many of our one-on-one drills are working on closeouts. And that is the other challenge is how do you make it a real, a realistic closeout situation? Because most one-on-one drills that I've seen, the player should just shoot it. Like, because mm-hmm. the closeout, the closeout isn't, <laughs> it isn't getting close to the defender to force a drive decision. So, yeah. you know, that's the other challenge that coaches have to think about is, you know, how are you giving context to the player? What are they actually working on in that one-on-one drill? And then if I think I'm working on something, is it actually, you know, is it actually working on attacking a closeout? if the closeout is so far away that the player is forced to drive a gap that isn't actually something they would do in a game. So those things, and I mean, our easy solution is we do three pass one-on-one. So we pass, I'll pass it to you. You pass right back. And then my last, exactly pass, last pass yeah. to you is underhand. So we know that I'm there. And basically in that drill, we would have a constraint that you can't shoot it initially so that we work on that, uh, you know, attack and uh, counter type of situation. Yeah. The, um, you know, and we're going to talk more about that, but were there dribble limits? Yeah, there were, like two, three dribbles. So, you know, that all, all good stuff like that. Um, but I think that's very common with the, with the club introducing that and all their small sided games. And, and, and again, dribble limits are fine. So, uh, But I do want to challenge coaches to think about it this way. Instead mm-hmm. of a dribble limit, think about a direction limit. Because the problem is not the number of dribbles. The problem is the direction the dribbles go. So we talk to our players about, okay, you cannot take two dribbles in a direction, not towards the rim. So you can take, you know, I can take a dribble, two dri- you know, I can take a dribble, you know, you cut me off and then I keep going wider, you know, and suddenly I'm at the basket in one-on-one because there's no help defense. Well, that doesn't really help me understand the game context too. So just as important, and, I, and again, I'm not advocating against dribble limits. I'm more advocating on coaches emphasizing that it's, it's where those two or three dribbles go that are more important than even the limitation of the dribbles. And if I take one dribble and you cut me off, you know, you get chest to chest with me is our terminology, then I need to counter and change directions more than I need to limit my dribbles. Because I find sometimes, especially at youth levels, when you limit dribbles, you just get a pile of bad shots. Yeah, it's very true. Just like chucking it was, like dancing, <laughs> off balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and, yeah. and someone always between them and the basket forcing a shot off their inside pivot foot. So, um, so uh, no, that's great. I'm gr- glad you raised that point because that's so important. Um, another problem, and, and I don't know if I actually said this before, is that when you do add a defender or you add a pad, um, it's, it's very blocked too is the danger, right? That you – when your player's going for a layup, like even though you're the coach and you're playing defense and you're guiding them, say you're going to step to the left each time a player drives in for a layup to force them to do a Euro type layup finish. Yep. Well, that's great, but that's blocked. Right. That even though you're adding a defender, 
you know, one, it's a coach. So it's, is the coach really a defender? You know, coach is cueing a decision, but we're not really a defender. And, and I, I, I find that even, and that's probably a whole nother conversation, shocking how at the NBA level or NCAA level, I see so many coaches on the floor playing defense. I, I'm telling you, you know what, Alex, I don't know about your game, but at this point in my life, I am definitely not playing basketball to play defense. <laughs> like I'm, I may be okay on offense at times, but I'm definitely terrible on defense. So I'm not giving that player any type of context. And usually, again, the tendency for a player when a coach on defense is that, you know, they're not going to embarrass the coach. <laughs> you know, they're going to do exactly what's prescribed so they don't go out of that, yep. you know, that uh, comfort zone. So, you know, when you do add a pad, you do add a coach, you know, you do add a defender that's guided. My, my advice is just don't make it blocked. That that person does exactly the same thing for each player coming in for a layup because then but that player, again, they don't have to think after the first few reps, they know exactly what Alex is doing at the basket. And then I know exactly how I'm going to do it. Oh, I don't have to think anymore. I can daydream and do yeah. this Euro and just do it right and make sure mm-hmm. again, I'm just doing it right because coach, those are the coach's expectations. And if I meet the coach's expectations, then coach is going to like me more and he's going to perceive that I'm really skillful and then I'm going to play the game. And, and, and that's, again, that's, <laughs> That is a challenge. So, Coach, what uh, what were some of the other things? I know you raised some other ideas here, uh, which I thought were great. Uh, progressing, and then you talked about some of the one on one scenarios. Uh, did, where did they start some of those scenarios? Did they did they start within ball screen? Did they start within handoff? Did they start within you know? Because if you think about Europe, I mean, think about I mean Canada. Forget about Europe. I mean, we run so many handoffs and ball screens that I'm like. How many times, you know, with the exception of a penetrating kick, are we really truly attacking in one-on-one situations? Like we're, we're, we're creating an advantage off of a, say it's a stagger screen, creating an advantage off of a ball screen. Those are what create the one-on-one situation. So where a lot of those one-on-one drills you've seen over your time, are they, are they starting in specific scenarios like that? Yeah, they, they could be starting off like a, a DHR or a ball screen. But, I mean, the, the age of the kids, that's actually the first year that they – work with the ball screen so they don't introduce in the club till the kids are 15 because they want the kids to obviously understand how to you know move move off the ball correctly and obviously that means you have to learn play around screens first but no especially a lot of the the three on three it would be some sort of advantage disadvantage uh stimulating the handle for a ball screen for sure so prior to that is the emphasis on uh you know cutting but mainly dribble drive is that what you, what you're saying about no ball screens? Maybe mainly dribble drive. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of reacting. You know, moving the right way according to where the ball was driven, etc. Um, so I mean, the club's got a very good approach regarding to that. So up until the age of twelve, it's, there's no tactical instruction. It's all just technical skills. So they want the players to be the most skilled players they can be, good one-on-one players, etc. Then they start introducing, you know, passing cut, reacting to dual penetration from 12 through to 15, 16, and then they add ball screens and more advanced concepts. So I think as a result of that, the players were, were very well skilled. And even though it was their first year, you know, working with ball screens, they were able to do more things because of, of that approach. Well, and I, and I totally agree in that sense that, like, once your players are skilled, you know, and I'm not saying skilled in terms of executing a layup or shooting. I'm talking about skilled in terms of, you know, as you said, the ability to be able to be comfortable with the ball. Then, then all this other stuff becomes much easier. It becomes much easier. Like decisions, you so know, incorpor- incorporating them in the ball screen or the down screen or the stagger or, or really any type of play you want to run. Like, you know, again, if coaches at the youth level at all places in the world would focus more on developing, you know, skill uh, you know, we, we, we'd have a better game for sure. But I keep saying, and I've said this many times is decisions are also skills, right? Like the ability exactly. to make a decision is a skill. So, so learning how to, you said, whether it's, you know, coach cued, as you said, in the Rubio example, or it's some type of, uh, you know, we would do a lot of advantage disadvantage. And I think you had that on your sheet that you talked about two on one. We spent a lot of time on giving the advantage to the offense but there's still at least one defender that is, you know, sometimes they have a constraint, you know, they have to cover the ball initially and then they can do whatever they want. 
but generally they get live pretty quickly, is that that one defender at least gives context to the passing. So the game like passes, you know, become better, uh, you know, the, the finish at the rim with a defender somewhere nearby and, uh, but leads to success, right? Which is ultimately what we're talking about as well is that, that developing confidence or perceived confidence is really important. So, so uh, what were your, what were your thoughts when you, when you wrote down two on one with me? Is that, is that what you were seeing that type of situation? Yeah, completely. But and I think you also made a good point in regards to, we mentioned it earlier and I, I forgot to touch on it. Just if you see players struggling with that game, so it's two on one um, with, with the, with the defender, you could, you obviously create, make the advantage bigger for the offense to improve their, their confidence to so say, you know, they're struggling to finish. Then you just say the defenders having to move, move, get to a certain spot. Uh, you just increase the, increase the distance. So they get there later. Offense has more time, to, you know, score the layup. And that's something I, I saw there. You don't always have to go to a draw straight away. You just have to be more creative as a coach, change the constraint, change the game a little bit, you know, make the space, space bigger, whatever. And then, you know, helps, helps players run the school even more effectively. I, uh, I just recorded this. So uh, by the time maybe this podcast is actually released, uh, I'll have it on my website. But um, I believe I would teach almost all youth skill development from two on one situations. You know, it's exactly what you're saying is that, you know, I certainly wouldn't be focused on handoff or ball screen, but we'd be yeah. focusing always on that shot or drive decision or, or, or you know, or sh- shoot drive pass decision or drive pass decision in some context, all three of those things are the most important thing that you can develop at that young age. And as you said, I, I say decision because having that one, dis- one defender just, just makes it so much more game like than doing it two on yeah. or yeah. doing it one on O. So I, I, I kind of, I did this with my new players is that I, I decided that how I was going to teach them from scratch with some of our concepts was we're going to do it all at a two-on-one situation. And when I say two-on-one, yeah. I don't want coaches to think it's two-on-one full court because coaches are always thinking about two-on-one full court. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about two-on-one in the half court where it's like, okay, uh, Alex is on the in, standing on the 45 and I'm in the corner and then one defender is coming out. And this is a foundation of all of our teaching. But it, it comes back to what, you, what you've said and what we've said many times is it gives context, but it also gives the advantage to the offense because we don't need to give the advantage to the defense. Yeah. Like ultimately, this is another thing that I saw in Europe. Uh, I went to Italy six years ago, and then uh, three years ago, I went to a bunch of different places in Europe when I traveled the world. And I don't think at one of those practices or skill development sessions, I saw any emphasis on defense. Like, it was all – at the youth level, I'm talking about. It. But even yeah. at the pro level, I'll be honest. Like, so much of it was focused on offensive development because I think in North America, our coaching culture is – play hard and, you know, be physical and be tough and, you know, all those things, you know, are great because I'm not discounting defense, but I'm just saying from the youth level, man, getting skilled on offense is the most important thing. So is is that fair? Like did my small sample size say, you know, did you see a lot of focus on offense? There's there's a lot more focus on the, on the offense and the defense. And, you know, even if there's a small sided game, you can still emphasize both. Um, but the emphasis is definitely more on the offense and building players who are more skilled, able to make decisions, you know, finish dribble with both hands, etc. Yeah, no, and, and I, I think that's important because I, I just, if I, if I would go to North American practices, I, you know, and that's always one of the questions I get asked is how much, you know, how much time do you spend on offense versus defense? You know, those different, different yeah. things. And I'm like, when, when I asked most of the coaches I was around in, in Europe, they would, they, we spent all of our time on offense <laughs> and, and they weren't, you know, and again, when you, when you reflect on the European player and you know, they're, they're uh, I guess the NBA level is most people's context of that is that you, yeah. you kind of visualize a skilled player who can yeah. make decisions and knows how to play. And I'm kind of like, I, I hear the debate all the time. Well, players don't know how to play. Well, I'm like, well, we don't ever put them in situations where they learn how to play. Completely. Um, you know, basketball, it's, it's like known as a thinking game and that's why the game's approach is so important because it makes players think and practice. And if you're just using the drills, the players aren't thinking and then it comes to the game and you know, they don't know what to do. So it's, it, yeah, it's so true. No, this is, uh, 
it, it, it's a, such a fun conversation because I know no matter what I say, we're not going to remove one on O from, from practices. I, I mean, if I could just get the three man weave out of practices, I feel like <laughs> I've accomplished something, but I know there's still like, I, that's, there's nothing more polarizing than me saying why, why you need to get rid of the three man weave. Cause there's such a tradition coaches would argue you know, so many different points about it. Well, of you know, course, how to run, how to move, how to pass. I'm like, okay, then all I say to them, just add a defender. Like anything you do right now, just add a defender. And that's the overall message of this is that even if you do one on O the first day, the second day, okay, after that, just add a defender. So that's my prescription for all coaches. If you do three man weave, that's great. Love it. Go with it. It's your philosophy. It'll work. Add a defender. Add a defender to three-man weave. Like, I, it's so simple, but just at the end of three-man weave, just add a defender. At least that full court progression leads to decisions at the point of attack. And, uh, you know, I guess that's our summary here, Alex, is that <laughs> just, just add a defender. I mean, it's, it, uh, there's so many, so many good thinkers out there uh, that are doing wonderful stuff and sharing their skill acquisition knowledge in a practical way. And, and I would say my summary of everything that I've read in the simplest form possible is just that, just add a defender and, uh, and, and your practices will be messier and you will sometimes leave practice thinking I am a terrible coach because it looked so messy. It didn't look like we got anything done, but believe me, it's, it's proven by research and it's proven by experience that that ultimately is much better for your players. And honestly, it's more fun for your players. Like you, I don't know, reflect on your playing days, Alex. How much did you like doing five on O inbound, one on O layup lines? Like, exactly. No, that's, that's a great example. I mean, growing up in England, obviously, as you can tell with, with the accent, <laughs> it, it was funny. All the P physical education lessons in school were like, you know, the 60 minutes. The first 50 minutes is all drills, and then the last 10 minutes is the game. And, you know, when I was getting ready for this podcast, I was remembering that, and everyone, you know, so many kids asked when I started coaching, oh, is there a game at the end? And it doesn't have to be that way. You can have the practice fun and engaging from the, from the first minute you start by using the game's approach. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's just so, so different to just drilling, 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 and just using the game's approach constantly throughout, throughout your practice. Yeah, no, there's no rule against playing five-on-five five to start your practice. And if you would come to our yeah. practices – uh, you, you would see, I mean, we do that almost every practice starts with five and five, four and four, you know, three and three. I mean, we, we don't do any, I mean, last year I made it a point so I could talk to people like you and kind of say it with, uh, with knowing I actually did it is that we basically did no on air drill the whole year with the team. Now people are saying, well, that's a university team. Yeah, no, that, you know, that, that does, that, that does maybe change the context a little bit, but I'm still saying if my, my seven year old daughter now, and have a five-year-old, if, if they progress into basketball and I start coaching them at the, you know, say eight, nine level, then as much as possible, I'm going to always have defense, you know, on yeah. the floor and saying, is there, could there be anything more impactful for my seven-year-old daughter than playing one-on-one -on -one against someone with constraints? And the, the main constraint I would have is you're not allowed to spin dribble. Because at the youth level, I find like someone who's just learning how to play basketball, that spin dribble becomes a default for being yeah. – you know, not being able to attack pressure. So true. And you obviously, know? I mean, I, I, I don't really teach a spin out of a drill. I teach it into a finish. But, uh, right, and that's fine. For, you know, for that, for that reason. But, um, and a great point I wanted to highlight you said about the, the messiness. I think for, for some coaches, it's, it can be difficult maybe to get buy-in from the parents or program administrators if, if you feel like your practice is looking disorganized. But I think just with the results you get from the game's approach and being able to show you know, the development and improvement in players, I think, you know, people could quickly see uh, the benefits that taking a, a more, you know, 21st century approach has to the traditional method. So many of these podcasts that I've done with coaches, um, you know, Alex, yourself, and uh, so many coaches, whether North America or around the world, it, it, it constantly comes back to that same point that you made, is that no matter what you do, you have to sell it to your players, and you have to sell it to your parents and sell it to your administrators and help them understand why you're doing it and what the benefit is. And with this method, more than anything, I mean, in my first conversation with my newcomers at a workout or a practice, 
I'm, I'm communicating essentially some of these points to them to get them to start to understand why we're doing it. Because it is very different. You know, if, yeah. if, if, if I had a new athletic director and he walked into my practices, he would, you know, I, I know that he'd kind of go, what the heck is this? You know, I know it when summer camps, if I have 80 kids in a gym at a summer camp and everyone has a ball, yeah. everyone's shooting at the same time. Everyone's dribbling at the same time. You know, and, and I know some parents are like, oh, this is so disorganized. I'm, I make sure I give them a disclaimer and say, no, this is absolutely, this is on purpose. <laughs> we are doing this on purpose. Exactly. This is messy on purpose. And here's the benefit and here's why. And, you know, we know at the youth level, like even those skilled kids that you're talking about at 15, 16, if they suddenly went and played a game, it would be somewhat messy. There would be a lot of unstructured moments, yep. of unscripted moments, and can they play in those moments? And, you know, that's, it's, that's a big reason why. So, Coach, anything else we want to uh, put forward in terms of some ideas to start with this? With the, with the game's approach? I mean, um, it's funny because I, I started doing it like, you know, I started coaching for the first – two years very much drill driven and then started using the games approach. And I think there's so many good resources online. Obviously a lot of people have, have spoke about this. We mentioned Brian McCormick earlier. I think uh, Mike McKay's got some good stuff. Obviously basketball Canada, uh, Stuart Armstrong, talent equation. Um, he's, he's got some great stuff on it, but I think you just have to embrace and be creative as a coach. There's, there's I don't think there's much you have to do as you mentioned to turn a drill into a game. We obviously said about adding a defender, but it just needs a little bit more creativity as a coach. And then how you teach using the games approach, I think it's really important in terms of how you instruct, in terms of letting the players, using questioning to, to let the players discover the answers to themselves. So instead of them to make, tell, tell them to pass a certain way, you ask them to figure it out. So they, you know, guided learning, see how, see how they, you know, how it works best for them. So I think how you instruct using the games approach is something really important for any coaches listening to this. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for reaching out, Alex, number one. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing some of your questions and sharing some of the, your insights in terms of the things you've seen as well. And uh, I think, well, I know this information can help all coaches and hopefully drives them to uh, look into it a little bit more. And uh, certainly if you go on basketball immersion, almost all of our blogs in some context cover this in, in some way. And uh, I've never actually addressed specifically your question. So this is a great way to be able to do it. So thanks for coming on board. Where can they follow you on social media, coach? Sure. So my uh, Twitter handle is Alex Sarama. Um, so it's a pleasure to be on. I'm definitely going to be posting. I'm going to start some, some blog posts just with the different ideas I have from observing things around Europe. So, uh, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that for anyone listening. Well, perfect. And make sure you share that, uh, those links with me and I'll share them to our basketball immersion, uh, you know, social media, uh, platforms as well so that, uh, we can uh, get some of that information out there. Thanks Alex. And fantastic. Thank you. Great to be on.